We now have a two-week sample size of what this LSU baseball team is post Paul Skeens, post Dylan Cruz, and post the 2023 National Championship run. So through two weeks, what is this team? You are Locked On LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, y'all? Welcome into Locked On LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can check out the podcast on YouTube. So if you're one of our everydayers and you normally listen on your preferred podcast platform, first of all, always appreciate me for making us your first listen every single day. You can also watch the podcast as well. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube and you'll get notified as soon as new episodes of the podcast drop. My name is Caroline Fenton and I am your host as I am every single day. And today's edition of Locked on LSU is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you will get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. All right, let's get into it. Second week of work has wrapped up from this LSU baseball team. LSU finishes out the weekend. Remember, they had four games Thursday through Sunday against Northern Illinois and Stony Brook, and they come out of the weekend three and one. They take down Northern Illinois on Thursday with a 10 to two win Friday, a loss to Stony Brook five to two. We'll get into that. Saturday, 5-2 to two win over Northern Illinois and then wrapped up the weekend with yet another high-flying offensive day on a Sunday, taking down Stony Brook 18-10. to 10. Uh, 28 runs on that day was definitely not on my bingo card, but it was at least good to finally see the bats moving, to finally get some momentum moving offensively. Um, you lose the game on Friday to Stony Brook. Is that a game that you should lose? No. But are you going to lose games like that throughout the season? Yes. It's a long season. You're going to lose games like that, especially early in the season. You're going to lose midweek games that you shouldn't lose. That's just the nature of this game. How many times have we seen this before? LSU sweeps a top 25 Auburn team and then turns around on Wednesday and loses to UNO six to five. Like how many times have we heard that story? Maybe not that exact scenario, but along the same lines, it's going to happen. You're going to lose games against teams that you are better than at least on paper. It happens. We're not going to hit the panic button. We're not going to freak out because I think that you can step away from this weekend, even dropping that game against Tony Brook and saying, look, I feel pretty good about this team. But what is this LSU baseball team? What I can feel like coming out of the second weekend is this team's really good and they have a, a ton of talent. They have championship level pitching, but they're inconsistent. They're good, but inconsistent. But my question to you is, didn't we kind of expect this? Like we kind of, ex we should have expected this at least early on in the season. Remember, it is still February. There is still a lot of baseball that's left to be played. We still have time before you get into conference play to really kind of get things settled, to really try and figure out what the identity of this team is. That's how I step away from this weekend feeling. This is a good team that has yet to find its identity. This is a good team that has yet to find its stride and is yet to figure out how they are going to win games on a night in, night out basis. But we should have expected that because this team got a lot younger. You lost a lot of veterans this past season. There are still a lot of question marks about who's going to be your starters in certain positions defensively. Your batting order is going to be shaken up. It has been shaken up over the past couple of weeks and even throughout the four games this past weekend. So there's a, a lot that's still up in the air. There's a lot of questions that you still have yet to be answered. So I think that inconsistency is probably fair enough to expect from this team. Now, you need to start figuring things out. You know, if you get into week three or four of conference play and you still have these inconsistencies and you're still struggling as much as at the plate as you did this past weekend with the exception of Sunday, well, then we got a problem on our hands. 
Because then you have to start asking some really difficult questions about this team and what they really are and what they truly can accomplish in this league. But right now, on February 26th, two weeks into the season, I, I, I can live with that. As long as you start to pick up breadcrumbs along the way. And those, those questions start to become answered a little bit more. That your vision of who fits in what place. What is the right piece at the right time? As long as you start to have glimpses of answers to those questions, that's what I can live with. But the inconsistencies, I think we should have expected it. Another thing I can take away from this team, I mentioned it, they got great pitching. You've got great depth. And of course, you still have some questions about Friday night, and we'll get into that coming up next. But now just kind of an overall view of, of this pitching staff what was the biggest concern that we had last year? Really all season long and going into postseason play, what I thought was going to stand between this LSU baseball team in 2023 and, and, and a championship had LSU not won the College World Series, it was depth of pitching. You just didn't have enough arms to get you through the postseason. Now, you had the right pitching at the right time, and you had guys step up in the biggest moments, and that's really what propels you to a championship. But the depth wasn't there. It's looking like early you have that depth. First and foremost, Fidel Uyoa continues to shine. He continues to be kind of that late game hero because last week he was outstanding in two appearances. He went two and one third innings, allowed only one hit and zero runs when he needed it most, when he needed someone to close you out. And then on Sunday, in an incredibly high scoring game when Stony Brook was able to run the score up, Fidel Uyoa gave you two innings, only gave up a single hit, struck out two, gave up zero runs. He continues to be one of those guys, one of those go-to guys that you feel really good about. Now, Gavin Guidry also gave you some good work, uh, some shutout work on Saturday. Christian Little gave you some shutout work on Saturday as well. It was good to see that from Christian Little, who was a guy that was pretty underwhelming last season. Now, is he going to be one of your go-to closers? We'll see. We'll see. I like what I, at least what I saw from him on Saturday. Um, Gavin Guidry. What his role is and how his role continues to grow, to grow throughout the season, we'll see. I, I do wonder if Gavin Guidry can ultimately blossom into a starter. But right now, between Fidel Yoa and Gavin Guidry, I think that you have two really, at least two pitchers that I feel really good about to be able to close you out. The kind of pitchers that you like, okay, throw them out there and you're like, phew, we, you know, we got the right guy to be able to close things out, at least with as little drama as possible. But I've really, really liked what I've seen from Fidel Yoa. And I don't know how you could see what he has done and not be incredibly excited about him. Um, so you've got great pitching, shaky offense. That's the inconsistencies. My goodness. It's ultimately what's caught, what cost you the game on Friday. You're only able to muster up two runs on six hits against the Stony Brook team. It's not good enough. You're not going to win very many games that way. And I don't care who you're playing. Now, I don't care if you're playing the defending national champion runner-up Florida Gators or if you're playing Stony Brook or Northern Illinois. You're not going to win very many games when all you can muster up is six hits and two runs. It was bad on, on Friday night. And, of course, you didn't get a whole lot of other help defensively. But Saturday wasn't much better. Even though you were able to win the game on Saturday and get five runs up on the scoreboard, you only got had three hits. Three hits! Against Northern Illinois, that's frankly just not good enough. And Jay Johnson was asked about it after the after the game on Saturday. And uh, it, this is what Jay Johnson had to say about the offense. We got to do a lot of things better. Uh, we got guys that care a lot. And when you have guys that care a lot, um, they uh, sometimes try to do too much, which is not a plan, uh, which they know that. So, um, you know, fortunate for us, you know, Luke pitched great. Uh, we didn't make an error, and uh, the guys in the bullpen did a good job. Uh, they gave us some runs early, which was great, and then Matt got a big swing. So as when you have a good team, you can win games without playing your best, and that's what I think we are, a good team that's not quite playing our best right now. The good thing, you're able to win games when all you can muster up is three hits. So I guess, you know, gold star to the defense, gold star to Luke Holman, who's on the mound on Saturday. The bad thing is, all you were able to get was three hits. And you heard Jay Johnson there, like the offense needs to be better. And it was hilarious. I couldn't make out which reporter asked the question. But a reporter asked a question like, do you feel like you had a bit of a breakthrough today offensively? Or do you think you were better today offensively? And Jay Johnson said, 
is that a serious question? <laughs> and it's no shade to whatever reporter asked that question. It's a fair question to ask, but Jay Johnson's response was perfect because you can tell just how pissed off and fed up he is with it. He knows it's not good enough, and he acknowledges that. Now, I think that the the silver lining there is what you saw Sunday. The Jay Johnson called his team out there, and then on Sunday – 17 hits, 18 runs. He had hits from nine different guys on Sunday in an, uh, an 18 to 10 win against Tony Brook. The good thing, the bats were moving. The bad thing, you still gave up 10 runs against Tony Brook. So this is a good team. As you heard from Jay Johnson, it's a good team, and you have a whole heck of a lot of talent. It's figuring out how to put all of these pieces together in its best winning formula. What is the best winning formula, at least on Friday nights? And is it what LSU's formula is right now? We'll get into that coming up next after just a few words from our sponsors. All right, I want to tell you about FanDuel. Give buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins, and you can bet on all of your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and so much more. That's my favorite thing about the FanDuel Sportsbook app is you have a ton of different things to bet on. It's not just the money line. It's not just the spread, but it's player props and it's really, really fun parlays, whether that's coming up with one yourself or checking out some of the parlays on FanDuel. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on and new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, rolling along here, Locked on LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And, of course, we are part of the Locked on Network, your team, every single day. And speaking of the Locked on Network, Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. So find Locked On Sports Today, now available on the free Fire TV channels app. All right, um, let's talk about Friday Night Pitching. What you got and what you have gotten from Luke Holman, the Alabama transfer, who is your Saturday night starter, has been outstanding. You have gotten everything that you could ask for from Luke Holman in his last two starts and his only starts in an LSU uniform. Thatcher Hurd, your Friday night guy, uh, has been less than desirable, um, at least in the outcome. So it's fair to ask because what you got from Thatcher Hurd in the opener against VMI Two and two-thirds innings, gave up five hits, four runs, struck out four. And that freaky, weird third inning where it was a bad ball call and then Thatcher Hurd got called for a balk and then it was just all downhill from there. But you got really solid first two innings of work from Thatcher Hurd against Stony Brook. Pitched a four and one-third, gave up six hits, three runs, four walks, but struck out eight. So here's the thing with that, you're hurt. You need him to go longer. You cannot have your Friday night guy pitching two and two thirds, four and one third. Yeah. You need more from him. You need more from him. He can't keep walking as many batters as he's been walking Four, four on Friday night. That number's too high. Six hits. That's far too high. Eight strikeouts? It, it's been funky stuff from Thatcher Hurd. Even in game one against VMI. Four strikeouts in two and two-thirds innings. I mean, I'll take it. It's not elite stuff, but it's not bad stuff by any stretch of the imagination. And it really didn't get bad until that freaky third inning with the bad ball and the bot call. So, 
yes, when he's 0-1, I think his ERA is somewhere around 8. Not good. So you would look at the results, and you can look at some of the numbers and say that Luke Holman could be a much better option for you on Friday nights. Now, I know that's going to be a topic of conversation, and I'm sure it's conversations that you've had with yourself or with other LSU fans. I'm not willing to go there quite yet for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, we only have two weeks of a sample size. Like, let's see both of these guys do a little bit more. If Luke Holman continues to give you stuff that you've been getting the past couple of weeks, while Thatcher Hurd struggles to find consistency, that he he pitches well but just loses his command, and you have a, a big enough sample size, you see more of a trend of that being the norm rather than the exception, then we can have that conversation. I just don't think that we're there yet, so I need more. And the second thing is, I feel like I'm giving Thatcher Hurd a little bit of a longer leash, a little bit more leeway, because we know what he can do. Because we've seen Thatcher Hurd be nails in high-pressure, high-stakes, high-stress situations. And Thatcher Hurd gave you exactly what you needed. We saw that in the postseason last year. If we didn't have that, if we didn't know that Thatcher Hurd was capable of that, then I would be a little bit more willing, I probably would be much more willing to make that switch earlier than I am now. Because Luke Holman has been absolutely fantastic. But is Luke Holman's best better than Thatcher Hurd's best? Honestly, I don't think so. But right now, you're not getting your best from Thatcher Hurd. And you're going to have to start seeing more of his best. You know he can have the command. But also, we can see him lose that command pretty quickly. So I'm not calling for Luke Holman on Fridays quite yet. I'm not calling for that switch quite yet, frankly, because I don't think it's a decision that you have to make right now. Because, yeah, you lost on Friday night, but I don't think it was just because of what Thatcher Hurd did on the mound in four innings that cost you that game. You had too many slip-ups defensively, and as you heard from Jay Johnson, you're not good enough at the plate. You're not good enough offensively. It would be a lot easier to maybe put a a Band-Aid on some of those wounds if LSU was able to muster up a few wins and you're able to take that game on Friday, 6-5, 7-5, whatever it might be. But you didn't. So it just emphasizes some of Thatcher Hurd's shortcomings that we saw on Friday night. We know what he can do. I think his best is the best that you're going to get from any starter um, on your pitching staff. But there is going to come a time. And I don't know if that's next week. I don't know if that's the week after. I don't know when that is. But if Luke Holman continues to be as good as he is and Thatcher Hurd continues to struggle as as much as he has, even though he's shown you some really great things over the past couple of starts, it was just also matched with some really not great things, then yeah, let's have the conversation. I'm just not quite there yet. I just can't quite pull that trigger quite yet. Um, But Luke Holman, man, what a pickup in the transfer portal this past year. He is so freaking good. He is as advertised. He is so freaking good. Um, All right, coming up next. Action on the Diamond was not the only action that we saw in Baton Rouge over the weekend. LSU basketball, LSU men's basketball, follows up a a thriller against Kentucky with a dud against Mississippi State. What went wrong for LSU on the court on Saturday night? We'll get into that coming up next. All right, here we go. Rolling along here, Locked on LSU. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. It was a tale of two LSU basketballs that we saw this past week. We saw LSU play such a great and complete game against Kentucky, and it was a funky behind the back, not even a really pass. It was just an attempt to keep it in bounds from Jordan Wright. Tyrell Ward lobs it up, gets it in. It was a, a thrilling win over Kentucky. You storm the court, two top 20 wins in that we in, in a week span because you beat South Carolina and then you turned around with a home win against Kentucky. Back to back top 20 wins. LSU won two straight. It looked like they were getting in, in the right direction. We 
even started to hear rumblings of, hey, if LSU could win out, could LSU be a tournament team? Now, sure, a lot of things would have to go right for LSU. It would have to be some things out of their control, not just winning out, but certain bubble teams losing and maybe pushing up your stock a little bit. But I thought, hey, looking at this schedule coming up, why not? Why not? We can at least have the conversation because it's not necessarily a murderer's row coming up for LSU. And then they followed up that emotional, exciting, all eyes on the in the ba- college basketball world on you, followed it up with an absolute stinker. Lost 87 to 67 on Saturday against Mississippi State at the PMAC. Is that not just so predictable? Is that not? Just like, could we not have just scripted that last week? Not just for LSU, but for Kentucky as well. That LSU has an emotional win. You storm the court. You're probably hung up on that all week long. You're probably thinking, man, that was was the coolest experience ever. And you take on a Mississippi State team that's been, frankly, awful on the road. Mississippi State, before beating you this past Saturday, had only won one conference game on the road, and it was at Missouri. And Missouri is the worst team in the conference. So Mississippi State is a team that has struggled on the road. They come into your building just a few days after you had a a, a game that was talked about on the Scott Van Pelt show later that night. And you play poorly. (laughs) Like, it was that... Not so predictable from this team, but also Kentucky follows up that embarrassing loss at, and, and at LSU, which that's what it was from Kentucky perspectives. It was an embarrassing loss at LSU. They follow that up. They go back home. They host a top 25 Alabama team that might be top two, probably is the second best team in the SEC, only behind Tennessee. Um, and they blow Alabama out and drop over 100 on them. And they were leading by like 30 points at one point in that game. Like, is that no not so predictable? The team that gets upset turns around and blows out a great team, and the team that did the upset and it hosts a team that's good, not great, and gets blown out. It's just, you know, kind of scripted these things. Um, I think the story, there's two things that really tell the story of why you lost to Mississippi State. First and foremost, and the most obvious thing is you couldn't do anything from three. You know, you're shorting, shooting about 42% from the field. Not great, but you'll take it. I think that you can win games that way, but you shot 17% from three. Only made three of your 17 three-point shots, or three-point attempts, rather. This is a team, this LSU team, they win games because they make threes. That is this offense. That is this LSU team. So when you make three of your 17 attempts, of course you're not going to win very many games. I think the second thing is turnovers as well. You turn the ball over 15 times. You gave Mississippi State more opportunities. You continue to let them get the momentum. Um, I don't think Mississippi State did really anything that outstanding other than just they made their threes and you didn't, and that's enough to muster up a 20-point loss. So it's a tough one. Unfortunately, I think we probably should have expected that. But you have four games left on your schedule. They are all winnable. You host Georgia tomorrow night in the PMAC. Remember, let's go back earlier to this season when you were in Athens and it was a last second. You just missed a shot. Georgia was able to win it either by one or by two. I believe it was by one. So you can, that's a winnable game at home against Georgia. Then you go on the road at Vanderbilt on Saturday and Vanderbilt is terrible. If they don't fire their coach this week, they'll fire him next week or they'll fire him the week after that. But Jerry Stackhouse is gone. I think his days are numbered because Vanderbilt's truly terrible. Then you go on the road at Arkansas. Not an easy place to play, but Arkansas, not a very good team. And then you finish out the regular season hosting Missouri. Those are not those. None of those are world beaters in there. You got three of the worst teams in the league coming up in your schedule, and it's not like Georgia is something really to write home about. So I think that you can win out the rest of the season. This loss against Mississippi State is probably just a little bit of a a slap of reality, a little bit of a reminder of, whoa, 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 whoa. We know you beat Kentucky, but uh, you're going to have to do a little bit more than what you did on Saturday in order to beat good teams, and that's what Mississippi State is. Good team, not a great team. That's how I feel about Georgia as well. Good team, not a great team. But they're a team that you can beat. They're a team that you should be able to lick your wounds after Mississippi State, get focused, 
and uh, and take on uh, and host uh, a competitive Georgia team coming up uh, on Tuesday night. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you for making Locked In LSU your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up in tomorrow's edition of Locked On LSU, Jaden Daniels made a decision that made headlines. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing for his future, for his reputation, for his draft stock? We'll get into that on tomorrow's edition of Locked On LSU.